U.S. Navy officers used to say, there is only one God, Poseidon, the God of the sea. There is only one legitimate church confessing this God. This is the United States Navy ruling the world ocean. And Alfred Tayer Mahan is the true prophet of this God and this church. The film is based on Jacek Bartosiak's essay. Motion is everything. Human nature and the tendencies inscribed into it, as well as the division of labor within society, mean that in our daily, often mundane tasks, motion is the basis of the proper functioning of both individuals as well as communities. We move, we connect, and in doing so, we fulfill social obligations as humans, we tend to our efforts, we progress, and we satisfy the needs of our minds and our bodies. Linked by these relations and functioning within the geographic confines of our immediate and more distant physical life, we go through our lives. The very same principle applies to relations between nations. The key issue to be resolved here are the rules of the road regarding strategic flows. The movement of people, the flow of goods, services, data, capital, knowledge, technology, and, in the times of war, the movement and deployment of our own and allied armies and the transportation of raw materials. While strategic flows determine the fate of nations and people, it should be not presumed that by their very nature they are free from interference, frictions or limitations. On the contrary, history shows that they were stringently regulated for most of recorded human history. A perfect example is Poland during the communist era. There were controls on issuing passports and traveling abroad, and even moving around the country. There were also rationing of goods, restrictions in international trade, and embargo on technology, and of course, strict control of the flow of knowledge and information. The Soviet Union and the countries of the Warsaw Pact were all cut off from the West and from the system of free strategic flows designed by the United States in the aftermath of the Second World War. Simply put, the world created then was based upon the maritime highway of the world ocean, which served as a transport thoroughfare of strategic flows controlled by the dominant US Navy after it had defeated the German Kriegsmarine and the Japanese Imperial Navy whilst two consecutive world wars wore out the declining British Empire. Washington's status as primus inter pares in the international institutions which the US has itself created under the Bretton Woods system was an inextricably linked element of this new post-war global strategic landscape. The system was further reinforced by the grand strategy of containment applied against the Soviet Union, as well as its satellite states landlocked in the continental landmass of Eurasia, preventing the Soviets from securing direct access to the world ocean. The strategy, the fathers of which were Nicholas Spikeman and George Kennan, was based on the creation of a system of alliances in the Eurasian coastal zone, the so-called Rimland, which maintained the US naval power while cutting the Soviets off the world ocean, which ultimately ended in their economic disaster. The unexploited potential offered by the vast spaces of inner Eurasia and its central region, the heartland, was feared by the British geographer and one of the founding fathers of geopolitics, Halford Mackinder. Mackinder warned that it was the vast spaces of the Eurasian landmass that triggered systemic rivalries between major powers and this was the place where empires were born and where they collapsed. It is for this very reason that every US administration, consistently throughout American history, as a major power, made a priority of establishing and maintaining a favorable balance of power in Eurasia, one that would preclude the rise of regional power in one of the critical locations of Eurasia. It is precisely for that very reason that the United States fought two world wars against Germany and engaged in a protracted competition with the Soviets. And this is precisely why the Americans are moving ahead now to confront China. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the former satellite states of the Soviet Empire joined the international community with its system of free strategic flows underpinned by the power of the United States. 
Notably, it was a system characterized by a lack of systemic tensions and competition between major powers. This, in turn, allowed for the rapid onset of globalization after 1991. Poland and other Central and Eastern European countries opened their markets to capital, commodity and technological flows, with all the consequences that came with it. Poland's accession to the EU likewise ensured free flows of people, knowledge and data. Furthermore, Poland joined NATO, expanding the Northern Atlantic Alliance's sphere of influence deeper into the old continent and much further from the world ocean. Strategic flows, by their very nature, concentrate in certain places. This in turn creates an unrelenting necessity to understand the principles of geopolitics and to implement them in practical measures by the tools of geostrategy. Some regions are simply more important than others as far as strategic flows are concerned, and it is in those places that political power should be projected, which explains why it is so important for world powers to create influence and foster support for caring through their interests. In order to simplify and help better understand this mechanism, those policies could be referred to as leverage. Gaining a foothold and later influence within geographically salient places, business contacts or market access require human networking, lobbying and influence building that concentrate in pivotal locations. Needless to say, military power is the ultimate leverage. It is not by accident that the US works diligently to retain its capability to project power worldwide. The rule of thumb here is simple. The closer any given point is located to the world ocean and to US military bases scattered across the Eurasian rimland, the greater the US power projection and consequently Washington's political influence or even preponderance. Conversely, the further any given territory is from the world ocean and deeper into inner Eurasia, the weaker Washington's power becomes. In the past 30 years, this reality was lost on many as was the necessity to think about the world in geopolitical terms or formulate geostrategic plans, for the very good reason. Thanks to the US global system and security architecture, geostrategy, in a way, formulated itself in automated mode. The US just upheld the world system on its own shoulders, much like the mythical titan Atlas. Washington's indisputable technological, military and economic supremacy, coupled with its status within the international institutions, provided the essential global good – security in key geopolitical regions. However, in the absence of one hegemon, geopolitics shows its true, harsh face. In the years of the peace dividend that took hold in the aftermath of the Cold War, quick economic development and the preeminence of the interconnected global market led many to believe that geography and distance had been rendered irrelevant, and that all goods and services are available on a 24-7 basis as long as they are commercially competitive. Those sharing this conviction seem to forget that global exchange cannot function without transport infrastructure and strategic corridors and that some regions are of greater importance than others that translates into wealth, leverage and power of those who know how to operate in the world understanding the above overriding principles. Roads, railways, cables or sea lines of communication all traverse strictly defined territories. In the absence of one leader and one set of rules, any aspiring power that wishes to access markets or to project military or political power and security interests would need to have both access and maneuverability within geopolitically pivotal spaces. In the past, this generated geopolitical rivalry, which in turn gave rise to conflicts. With the likely further decomposition of the present international order, that rivalry will return. We are already witnessing the first symptoms of that happening in the places on the remote fringes of American power projection capability. In the South China Sea, in the Baltic Sea and in the Sea of Azov. Generally speaking, any given nation is guided by two vectors, synergic in their nature, and both serving the interests and power of the nation. Geostrategic imperatives directed outwards are access to foreign markets, raw materials, resources, creating and maintaining supply chains for its economy, 
securing lines of communication with allies, and defending against political and military leveraging by foreign powers, which sometimes gave rise, especially in landlocked locations, to the need of creating buffer zones right behind national borders. That stems from the fact that neighboring powers are usually in a position to exert the most acute pressure, especially if there are no natural barriers between nations. The other vector driving the nation is directed inwards and pertains to domestic policies. It includes creating synergy effects between resources and labor, with the proper infrastructure buildup facilitating strategic flows. Coupled with capital investment, entrepreneurial spirit, resourcefulness, and the proper management of the fluid system of the supply chain, they form the healthy blood circulation of any nation. As such, strategic flows will always be literally a top national security priority for any nation. Here, the example is the efforts of the Second Republic of Poland to connect the resource potential of Silesia with Gdynia and the Central Industrial District that is, the communication line connecting Poland with the World Ocean for the port in Gdynia, ignoring the influence of the neighboring powers. There are few places as important within entire Eurasia as that which Poland and her neighbors, Belarus and Ukraine, occupy. Hence, it is of little surprise that the tale of Polish statehood is that of constant struggle for non-interference of neighboring continental powers which have inevitably tried to subordinate this crossroad between Western and Eastern Europe and harness its potential to best serve their own strategic flows. Because of its pivotal geographic location, Poland's strategic interests extend beyond its own borders, whatever may they be at any given moment in history. The fate of the country was always inextricably linked to thinking in terms of geopolitics. This way of thinking was imposed upon by requirements of survival in the borderland between the seafaring European Peninsula and the continental Europe. Being located at the heart of Europe, on the northern European plain that forms a natural conduit between the world's most prominent land powers of recent past, driven by the desire to assure free access to the world ocean via the Baltic ports, meaning that whoever ruled the country faced pressure from not only powerful neighbors to its east and west, but virtually the heft of entire continents from both sides. For those external forces, Poland was interesting as an interconnector. For Poland, the goal was to prevent her from objectification. Between Germans and Russians, the former embarked on the continental expansion towards the inside of the Eurasian supercontinent, moving away from the Anglo-Saxon controlled world ocean, the latter locked in the merciless geography of northern Eurasia with no access to warm ports. This situation made it possible for the maritime powers to play the intermarium countries as a wage of their influence over the strength of Germany and Russia. As a result, the countries of the region were cut off by the world ocean and felt constantly threatened by powerful neighbors. In this context, it is easy to understand why Warsaw and other Central Eastern European capitals wanted to see the unipolar moment of the post-1991 Pax Americana last forever. The past 500 years, since the daring European sailors claimed the Atlantic, have proven that the essential locus of power, the place where strategic flows take place, is the world ocean. It is a great enabler that offers the promise of wealth, social mobility and trade. It is a conveyor of sorts, of dreams and aspirations, of great fleets and great wealth that motion, colonies and trade generate. By linking all of the world's seas, the world ocean is the most accessible, the cheapest and, if the global maritime hegemon so desires, a free highway of strategic flows. Control over the world ocean gave rise to a new division of labor, core areas aggregating the strategic flows around London, Rotterdam or New York, where capital rich had access to technology and controlled the technological cycles, while peripheries and semi-peripheries were commissioned to produce to provide products to core regions. This system is hierarchical by definition, and so the core can juggle peripheries relocating production if not at will, then at least with a degree of impunity. 
the ease with which production can be relocated between peripheries is best exemplified by the Netherlands relocating their grain production to the agrarian empire of the old Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, far away from the Atlantic in the early infancy period of globalization. A more recent example is that of the US moving its labor-intensive production to China, allowing the cost of living to drop significantly and in consequence easing the economic burden of the middle class. Generally speaking, this system has been characterized by a constant process of allocating capital within the economic chain of production towards low-cost labor and towards better returns on capital, higher yields, more enriching resources and faster opportunities. All in all, this was very convenient for the powers controlling the world ocean as they had an effective toolset of coercive measures at their disposal. Naval blockades, sanctions and other friction mechanisms imposed on strategic flows to discipline recalcitrance. Examples of such could be observed in the actions of Donald Trump towards Iran, Germany, China and Russia. The defining characteristic of core regions was indispensability. While one periphery could be replaced at the cost of another, the core could not. For peripheries and semi-peripheries, the opportunity to engage in trade with core regions was indispensable and a key element of any commercial activity. The proliferation of rail as a means of transport in the 19th century allowed for the expansion and proliferation of strategic flows in continental Europe and the Eurasian heartland. In consequence, it enabled the rise of Germany and Russia in the 19th and early 20th centuries. In the 21st century, the very same principle means that China can pursue its Belt and Road initiative. The project must be Mackinder's worst nightmare, one that he admonished sea powers over a century ago and one that the strategies of the Office of Net Assessment at the Pentagon must surely lose sleep over today. Today's connectivity made possible by modern highways, pipelines, high-speed rail and air travel could feasibly all be used in a coordinated fashion, creating a complex overland supply chain of mutually dependent markets in Eurasia. Those new technical remedies to the tyranny of distance and difficulty of traversing the Eurasian landmass by default increase the power of continental land powers relative to sea powers, unlike in the past 500 years. Once the new overland system has matured, whoever controls the world ocean will no longer be able to claim control over the pivotal locations where strategic flows occur. To put this into perspective, the land-based lack of the Belt and Road Initiative meant to connect and bring together 55% of the world's GDP, 70% of its population and 75% of its energy resources is nothing but a geostrategic design at a massive scale, with China becoming the new core of this alternative world trading system of new connectivity. Just as in the past all roads led to Rome, in the future are to lead to Beijing. Freedom of strategic flows we know from the past three decades have led to two phenomena. One, to the overall increase of prosperity, albeit distributed unequally a fact that grew to be a cause for concern for some in the West. Two, to increased connectivity, leading to a greater interdependence. Interdependence and inequality do not necessarily pose a problem as long as there is one hegemon underpinning the stability of the system. The Americans, being the sea power that they are, the victor of two world wars and the Cold War, capable of projecting military force globally, controlling both the global banking system via the SWIFT system and global currency markets, presiding formally or informally over international institutions, achieved 30 years ago what had once seemed impossible. They created a global system that grew to be accepted by virtually everybody who wanted to prosper. Most importantly, however, great power competition over the rules of the road of the global order was avoided. Japan and Germany, the two major powers defeated in the World War II, submitted themselves to a framework of cooperation created by Washington and, in doing so, benefited from Pax Americana using maritime transport and the relative stability of the international order to offload their export industrial capacity overseas. 
This system therefore proved to be a masterstroke of US strategic planning. China also sought to enrich itself and therefore was willing to stomach US supremacy, while Russia, defeated and crippled by its intrinsically inefficient economic system, was plunged into chaos and had little alternative than to accept US hegemony, while ordinary Russians were happy to get their taste of freedom and free travel for the first time in over 70 years. This assessment was especially true of the Yeltsin era, while Russia sought to attract foreign investment and technology. Other Western countries supported US policy and offered unanimous support for Pax Americana, meaning that this period may be labeled more accurately not necessarily just a unipolar moment, but rather a harmonious and well-directed concert of the West in its zenith of power and status. All of that, all the power, affluence and prosperity were derived on its rudimentary level from the connectivity of the world ocean. For the better part of the last 30 years, the interdependence that lay at the core of Pax Americana has not caused any greater animosity or generated major structural tensions. When norms governing the system are called into question, this interdependence automatically becomes a vulnerability for the weaker party and leverage for the stronger one. Power, in spite of all the idealistic proclamations of politicians, still governs and dictates the behaviors and actions of nations and major powers alike, much like gravity still governs physical objects. The very concepts of power and power relations lie at the core of politics. Power is, simply speaking, an ability to influence reality in a way desired. In the case of nations, power dictates whether a nation can achieve its goals. Most importantly, in the sphere of foreign policy, where failure to do so means it will become subjugated to the policies of others, dependent and subordinate to the needs of foreign powers. Violence and coercion manifest themselves when one power has enough of leverage over the affairs of another to control and influence its actions even against its will. Economic sanctions are also a form of leverage especially if imposed by core powers of the given economic system. War is of course the ultimate leverage, and so nations are compelled to field armies to appeal, or to prevent others from appealing, to brute force. When the rules of the road governing a system of which interdependence is a central part are called into question, actors within that system start seeking leverages to influence other actors simply in order to affect their behavior. Then, interdependence such as control over supply chains, raw material resources or transport corridors, free access to which appear to be a certainty in a globalized world, becomes an asset and a means to influence the actions of other nations. Leverage. A zero-sum game kicks in. With deepening rivalries, a tension arises between freedom of strategic flows and the attempts to limit this freedom. Free access to transit through global commercial routes, such as the world ocean, airspace or the internet, are then transformed from a global good into a licensed good that can be accessed only by friends and allies. The unipolar world with the US arbitrator is a thing of the past, mainly due to Beijing, whose goal is to create supply chains independent of the United States' influence contributing to the emergence of a new continental economy that would break the undisputed power of the world ocean. The new era of a power struggle over the world's strategic flows has begun.